Hello everyone and welcome to our first webinar for today. I am Mohammed Nzajali, Petroleum Engineering student at University of Oklahoma and I will be your moderator for this amazing webinar. Our webinar today is about Introduction to Process Safety Engineering uh, which will be presented by Engineer Omar Abdesalam. Engineer Omar is a Process Safety Engineer at Shell Egypt. Engineer Omar is a Process Safety Engineer and Shell Egypt worked within various process and process safety engineering fields of experience, including brownfield project operations, engineering design, and commission in onshore and offshore production facilities. His overseas, his overseas and local experience includes LNG engineering design, petrochemical operations, and unconventional processing plants, offshore production operations, and detailed engineering. He worked with Shell, PJ Group, Amr Forster, Wheeler UK office and QGC Australia. Engineer Omar has master's degree in technical safety engineering, is an associate member in ICAM and currently pursuing a chartership as professional process safety engineering. Engineer Omar is DSE and HEMP and LOPA facilitation certified from Shell, has two papers as an author in one petrol. It's our pleasure to have you today, Engineer Omar, and the mic is definitely yours. Thanks a lot, Mohammed. Thank you all, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, for this uh, great opportunity uh, to share with you some uh, info about process safety. And um, this great work uh, happens in Arab Oil and Gas Academy. Um, today, we are, work we are going to, to speak a little bit about process safety. I will not go uh, into details, uh, because process safety is a big sector, actually. And um, I know that maybe the background, uh, which uh, a little bit relates to process safety, is chemical engineering. However, it, uh, uh, nowadays, um, people who are working in process safety have a lot of backgrounds, different uh, backgrounds. Uh, it's an emerging sector, and um, the importance of process safety raised during the past decades and still uh, uh, important nowadays and in the future as well. And we still have a gap in process safety expertise in the industry. So. Uh, it's a good one. I encourage uh, if uh, you didn't even uh, make your uh, mind uh, to, uh, to, to maybe which, which sector you will join or maybe uh, to be part of, think about process safety and I will give you a glance about uh, this, uh, this uh, sector of, uh, of engineering today. Let's go for uh, the agenda. I will start with uh, the identification of uh, the hazard and the, the uh, if, you, if you can call it the the, the, the details of uh, an incident and uh, and the anatomy of the, of the incident uh, if you can if you can mention that so how can we uh, categorize the the incident and how can we make sure that the safeguards are existing and uh, nowadays all of the companies around the world uh, in Egypt and in Australia and all of the maybe most of the uh, companies around the world are making sure that they have a document called safety case safety case which is including all of the hazards and the risks uh, you have at site, offshore or onshore, platform or onshore facility, whatever it is, and how you can manage it. And to reach to this document, you have to pass through a way by identification of all of these hazards and all of these safeguards by the bow ties, which we'll speak about it in a moment, and till we reach performance standard, but afterwards we can develop our document, which is the safety case. Next, we'll give you just, uh, we'll, we'll touch on the inherently safe design approaches uh, in the industry, especially in the design phase of uh, a project, and how can we make sure that the, safe, uh, the design has been done in an inherently safe uh, method. Afterwards, we'll uh, touch on uh, process hazard analysis, PHA methods. We have a lot of methods, and today we'll just speak a little bit about uh, QRA, quantitative risk assessment, what if, and a hazard. Uh, HAZOB stands for Hazardous, uh, Hazards and Operability Study, but we'll, we'll go for that when we speak about HAZOB. And at, at the end, uh, if you have time, we'll go with what is PSMS. Uh, PSMS stands for uh, Process Safety Management Systems. We have several management systems, and we'll go for one of them uh, if we still have time, as I've said. Let's start directly. And what is process safety? Um, formally, we can say that process safety refers to the management of hazards that can give rise to major accidents involving the release of potentially dangerous material, the release of energy such as fire or explosion. By, but in, in other words, 
easily you can say that post safety scope is only to prohibit or to prevent any potential of loss of containment of any hazardous material whether it's a hydrocarbon for example or a material which is under certain uh, conditions like high pressure high temperature which can, which can cause harm not only to the personnel but even to the environment or can cause uh, uh, cost loss so this is the process safety we don't want the hydrocarbon or the or the uh, the, the dangerous material to come out from the pipeline or the vessel or whatever uh, equipment we have. We, whatever methods and whatever tools we are using in the post safety engineering is to maintain it inside it by a lot of calculations, by a lot of simulations, uh, a lot of actions to be uh, done on safety critical elements, all of this just to maintain it inside the pipeline. Give you just an example of what happened uh, before. One of the incident uh, back in 1984, it's Fopal gas tragedy, it was in India. 27 tons of methyl uh, ISO uh, cyanate uh, has been released and around 20,000 has died till the moment because of this incident. So you can imagine how the reputation of the company can be affected, the personnel uh, died uh, because of something which, can, which could have been uh, uh, eliminated or uh, avoided. That's why process safety is important. Maybe that, that erased the uh, importance of process safety during the past decades, as I've said. And a lot of other incidents, maybe some of them are very popular, like Piper Alpha or Chernobyl or Texas City, which affected BP a lot, even uh, till, uh, till close time back, uh, by cost and reputation and everything. So, uh, and what's next? Hopefully nothing. This is our target. Hopefully that will, nothing of this incident will happen again. Let's go for the first topic we will speak about today, and which is the, the, the stages of identification of the hazard till the end, uh, which, which uh, at, at this stage, which will identify all of the hazards and how to manage them in a safety case uh, document, as we have said. So the first step is to identify what is the major accident hazards at the facility onshore or offshore, as we have said. And to, to know what is major accident hazard, we need to know what is a hazard. So the hazard is, is a physical situation which can potentially cause affect three things and in another uh, lives we can say four things so if we just focus on three things which is human injury or human fatality or personnel uh, effect in general the most important one and this is the vital thing we can uh, focus on in, in, in uh, while we are doing the, uh, the hazard analysis second the damage of property or cost or money money at the end it's money so we don't need to lose uh, money because of any uh, accident or any uh, loss, if you can say. Third thing, which is damage to environment, whatever maybe toxic thing goes to the sea, um, toxicity to the uh, gas, uh, to, uh, gas to the uh, atmosphere, uh, whatever effect on the environment is essential as well to be calculated while we are doing the hazard analysis. And the fourth thing, which is not uh, mentioned here, is reputation. And uh, a lot of companies now put it in their risk matrices. Uh, as important uh, one, so a reputation can be the fourth to be uh, to be affected by any physical situation, which is a hazard. So this is the hazard. Uh, what is risk? Risk is a factor of two things: likelihood and severity. And likelihood is by its name. So likelihood. So this incident can happen one in two hundred years, one in three hundred years. Maybe in some cases we can even reach one in ten thousand. This our. Um, this the, the, the factor we sought to reach, even to, even if uh, it can be reached or not. However, it uh, it's the aim, and the severity. Severity is one of the effect, effect of one of the factors which we spoke about, which is uh, personnel, uh, cost, uh, environmental reputation. So, for example, one of them is ten fatalities. For example, it's a big uh, big loss. So, the risk is a combination between likelihood and severity, and at the end, you have to decide uh, what is the level of the risk. From these two numbers, and we'll show we'll show you in a moment uh, how can we calculate that. To get the major accident hazards in your facility, you have to do a hazard identification uh, um, study, and this study is uh, done by a group of people who have expertise um, not only in the uh, on this uh, on this uh, plant in, in in the whole industry, and it's it, it should be done as per ISO one seven 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 one triple seven six to identify all of the major accident hazards. So we have identified the hazards. Uh, for example, our hazard is uh, natural gas. So natural gas to be released, uh, it can cause uh, uh, explosion or uh, fire, which can lead to uh, single fatality, for example. So this is our decision. 
Uh, we have a risk matrix here on the left hand side is the severity and the factors of this severity is injury, hum uh, environment and asset. And uh, maybe you can add reputation or maybe not. Some of the, it depends on the company approach. So for example, if they decided that this scenario or this hazard uh, can cause a single fatality if this uh, scenario happened. So in our case, it would be eight as shown here. And then they have to go and see what is the likelihood of this incident to happen. If it happened before uh, in sister companies or it happened in the asset itself, or it didn't happen ever, they didn't hear about it. Uh, for example, if we decide that it has happened in the asset, they, they knew that it happened in the asset before. So the result is this one, 64, which you present here in our red zone. Red zone means that it's a major accident hazard. If the result is green or uh, blue, or maybe uh, even orange. Uh, by the way, it's uh, this risk matrix is only just uh, an example. It differs from a company to another, totally. Maybe you can see totally different uh, risk matrices, but this is the most maybe common one. So at the end, if it's red, and this is common amongst all of the companies, so if it's red, it is a major accident hazard. So once we decide that it's a major accident hazard, we have to go next to identify all of the safeguards and all of the scenarios regarding this uh, major accident hazard because it's important and we have to manage it and we have to make sure that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's totally controlled. Next step is to develop bow ties. You know all bow ties, which mean the, the suit, bow ties for suits. But in here, it's not, a, it's not for the suits uh, for sure. It's, it's from its shape, they name it bow ties. However, uh, it's not uh, any, just, just a name. At the end, it's a method to uh, visually represent the hazard, the threats, the consequence, and the top event of any scenario which can lead to a catastrophe, whatever the catastrophe is, and what is the, whatever the, the effect is. And we use it only when we decide that we have to, uh, we have to um, analyze a major accident hazard. So as we've said before, if the risk is very high, so it's a major accident hazard, and if it's a major accident hazard, so we have to, if it's a major accident hazard, so we have to go to bow ties. So bow ties is consistent, co consists of what? We have on the left-hand side now a, a threat, top event, consequences, and the hazard itself. And then we'll talk a little bit about the barriers, but leave the barriers now. Actually, the, uh, the most important part of this one However, leave it for now, and let's see what is the threat, for example. A threat here is something which can lead to the top event, lead to the loss of containment, lead to the scenario which we don't want to, to reach. If you have the corrosion in your pipeline, so it will lead to a loss of containment. If you have high pressure, high temperature, human factor, uh, weather, whatever, these are the threats uh, you have uh, in your case. Uh, for example, if you are talking about natural gas in a pipeline, so it's a threat here, the common threat is Corrosion, for example, and high pressure in certain situations. This is our threat. Okay. What is the top event? What is what? What? Uh, what are we afraid of? The top event is either loss of control or loss of containment. Loss of containment. If you are talking about hydrocarbon, for example, in our case, loss of control. Control. Uh, it 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 won't happen when, for example, the hazard is not related to explosion or fire. Like, for example, if you are working at height, it's a hazard. So if you lost control, you will fail. You will uh, you will uh, you will fall, and at the end, uh, maybe it can lead to an injury or fatality as well. And the consequence, I think you can say it: it's fire, explosion, fatality, uh, pollution, and maybe bad press after an incident. So this is the ultimate consequence, which we don't know, to, which we don't want to, to reach. So at the beginning, we have a threat, and we are passing through. We are passing through lines here. We have some barriers here, and then if it's failed, we will reach to the top event. We have another barriers. If it's failed as well, we reach to the consequence which we don't want to, to reach to. And the hazard is a hazard which you have mentioned before, which we have mentioned before. This is a very very simple example about it. It's it's, it's far from oil and gas, but just wanted to mention it uh, just to make it uh, simpler. So, for example, if you have a car, and uh, in this case, it will be the top event will be loss of control. So if you have a threat like bad weather, poor visibility, tired driver if he's tired, or no speed limit, what avoids you to, to reach the loss of control, which can lead at the end to uh, an accident, 
is uh, that you have high headlights, for example, uh, simple uh, speed uh, limits, uh, coffee, if you, the driver have coffee. It's a very simple thing, and but either because of this, he didn't, it, it, it failed, and it led to close control. Then we have other uh, protection layers, which is seat belts. He lost control already, but seat belt can still help him, or airbags, or crash uh, barrels. But if it failed as well, you will reach to the ultimate consequence. This is simply what is meant by bow ties to uh, to identify or to identify the fact or each um, element of an incident, the consequence, the hazard, top event, threat, and the barriers. In this case, let's think together what is the uh, threat. Or actually, what is the hazard, for example? A hazard is easily, it's the crude oil itself. So what is the top event here? The loss of containment, which we spoke about, loss of containment or loss of control. But in our case, it's loss of containment, what we are afraid of crude oil. Next, what is the threat? Corrosion. And all of these can be the consequences. Hopefully that was clear. And then let's go to the safeguards or barriers. In, 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 in terminologies of POTI, we use barriers. Uh, but we can mention it as a safeguard or even layers of protection. Safeguard any device, system, or action that could possibly interrupt the sequence of events following an in initiating cause. It's simply whatever action or whatever barrier can prohibit from going from this stage at the threat to the top event or from the top event to the consequence. And these ones can be named as control ones, which are preventive or preventing, preventive. So you are preventing the top event to happen. But in case the top event happen, we have loss of control already or loss of containment already. So we have some mitigative uh, barriers. Types of layers of protection or type of safeguards or type of barriers. The process design is the first barrier you have. If you are designing the whatever equipment you are using according to the design pressure and temperature and all of the aspects, so the pressure design, the process design would be your first barrier. Next, basic process control system is one of the most uh, famous ones and most important uh, safeguards. Basic process control system consists of a sensor. And for example, if you are sensing a pressure in a vessel, so it would be a pressure transmitter over here going to the pressure controller and to the uh, final element, which is a valve, to control the outlet or inlet accordingly to, um, to accommodate the pressure uh, you, are, uh, you are setting at. So this is simply what is process, uh, basic process control system. It's, it shouldn't be pressure, it can be temperature, it can be uh, flow, it can be anything, level, uh, a lot of things. So this is the concept of basic process control system. So what is safety instrumented systems, or in other words, safety instrumented functions? It's a very important action uh, taking uh, layer protection. For example, if you have this uh, vessel over here, and we have a level which which is going down, and it's it, it, the level is, is very low right now. It's it's very dangerous to to reach such a level because it uh, it then can go for a blow by case and go to the second uh, next stage and maybe can uh, cause a catastrophe or a, or a, a, an explosion. So what the safety system do is that it gives a sensor similar to basic process control system. However, it gives us a sensor to the uh, ESD, emergency shutdown, and it goes to the valve to close directly. It's an on-off uh, action. It's not only a controlling uh, action like the PPCS or basic process control system. So this is the difference between both. It's uh, a higher level uh, safety instrument system higher than a basic process control system. Then uh, the next level is uh, active devices such as relief uh, valves. I think it's very common uh, to you. These are the relief valves on uh, any vessel, offshore or onshore, they are used. And we have plenty of types of them, uh, depending on the, uh, on the uh, operation or the process itself. And passive uh, devices such as dikes. Dikes is uh, very familiar. And blast walls, uh, it's not common to be found in all of the uh, assets. Uh, depending on uh, the quantitative risk assessment, they build it. And we'll speak a little bit about quantitative risk assessment and furthermore uh, in the coming slides. So these are passive. At the end, there is a loss of containment. There is um, a leak of uh, the uh, of this tank. At the end, the dike will control it or uh, will limit uh, its distribution. And at the end, human human action evacuation. So this.
just a very very common way of categorizing the laser protection starting from process design till the last thing which is emergency response uh, going through with the basic control system safety and systems mitigation here uh, um, i gave you an example as the relief system fire and gas detection system as well is one of the most familiar uh, mitigation systems plant emergency and uh, community emergency response this representation of uh, how you um, how you can uh, represent uh, the layers you have uh, to prohibit the ultimate uh, consequence. Swiss cheese model is very uh, common way of representation as well. And uh, here you can find engineering control, administrative control, uh, behavioral controls. And at the end, if you have a leak or a loss of container already, there is still post incident mitigations like fire suppression or fire fighting system, emergency response plan, uh, and uh, safe work practices. Just uh, representing if you have holes, so the incident or the hazard will still pass. And this holes means fail of a, a barrier or fail of uh, a safeguard. Uh, preventive safety uh, safeguards, we spoke uh, about it. Preventive, uh, to prevent uh, from the top event uh, to happen from a threat. The types of it uh, is operator response to bring back and upset uh, conditions back to safe limits. Operator response in general to any alarm is a preventive safeguard. Uh, SIFs, which is where we spoke about safety instrumented systems or functions, uh, still a type of preventive. Ignition source control, and there is a very big topic which is called uh, hazardous area classification regarding the ignition source control and how can we control all of the ignitions around all of the equipment. Uh, um, this can be maybe taking uh, another session or something. So ignition source control uh, is one of the important preventive safeguards. Uh, emergency relief systems uh, like the mitigation and uh, and other last resort preventive measures, manual dump in case of, uh, it's, it's a little bit common in uh, the platforms offshore. The mitigation, mitigative safeguards, uh, uh, generally whatever happens, whatever can we, we can be protected with after the release. Uh, like the tank dikes we showed before, explosion blast uh, structures and fire, fire. there is fire uh, uh, walls as well, not only uh, blast walls. Uh, there is fire release detection and alarming uh, uh, systems as well, deluge uh, around the tanks. If you, you have any tank with the deluge system to protect it against collapse in case of a fire around it, it's a very common uh, uh, safeguard uh, uh, in mitigation. Foam and vapor mitigation systems plus event specific PPE, APE, personal protective equipment, and uh, emergency response and emergency management plans. So hopefully that was clear, uh, the difference between the mitigation and mitigative safeguards and, uh, and preventive uh, safeguards. So for now, our target, we defined all of the major accident hazards in the facility. Now we are doing a bow tie for each major excellent hazard to identify all of the barriers, all of the safeguards in this scenario, and to make sure that the, we want to make sure that safe, these safeguards are adequate, maintained, and uh, kept uh, healthy to be ready to protect us whenever we need. This is our target. But can we put any barrier uh, in the bow tie? No. It has to pass uh, several uh, questions, several uh, qualifications before we can put it in a bow tie and we see we say that it's a valid barrier. Three things has to be there, effective, independent, and auditable. Effective by its name, is, it should be big enough, fast enough, and strong enough. So for example, if you are saying that we have a relief system uh, in on a, on a vessel and it can protect against uh, blow-by case, for example, uh, it should be designed accordingly and uh, it has it can be it should be tested however it cannot be tested for the real uh, for the real scenario however they, they have some other tests to make sure that it, it can uh, it can um, it can do its uh, its work and fast enough so it has to do it within 15 minutes for example so it has to uh, to be there uh, effective so this what this one what's meant by effective okay it's effective so is it independent what does it mean by independent Independent is that, for example, we spoke about basic process control system and it has a sensor. If this sensor goes to both alarms, one alarm and one of them is doing an action to a final element like a valve. So the same sensor gives two actions or two indications. One is alarm and one is an action to the final element. 
you cannot post uh, you cannot put both so you cannot put, uh, put uh, the alarm and the basic process control system itself as two independent layers no they are dependent because they have common cause failure common cause failure which is the sensor if the sensor failed both of them will, will fail so they are dependent if they are independent so they have to have uh, different sensors hopefully, hopefully that was clear so independent the barriers itself together they don't have to be dependent by any mean and there's no common cause failure by any mean within each other in addition they have to be independent from the threats itself so if the threat by any mean uh, relates to the barrier we cannot put it as a barrier third thing which is editable so it, uh, it should be yani, uh, you cannot you cannot use a soft thing uh, and and put it as an auditable so for example if you uh, if you have the psv yes it, it should be it could be auditable you can do inspection to it you can do a test record keeping for it so it has to be auditable at the end to make sure that it can maintain its functionality throughout the, the years and make sure that we are safe whenever we need it. So again, it has to be effective, strong enough, big enough, fast enough. It has to be independent from each uh, from any other uh, barrier. And it has to be auditable at the end. Then it can be valid. And we can put it as a barrier. And then we can put it as a safety critical element. So again, the bow ties uh, target is to identify all of the barriers we have for the major accident hazards which we identified. And at the end, all of these barriers we identified which are valid, it will transfer by a mean or another to safety critical elements. So what are the safety critical elements? By its mean, by its name, safety critical is an element which is, if it's failed, it will, have, it will cause uh, a problem in your facility. So safety critical element, it's an equipment structure or system whose failure could cause or contribute to a major accident or whose purpose is to prevent or mitigate the effect of a major accident. Uh, and one of the, I mean, just as an example, examples include emergency shutdown valves, pressure safety valves, life boats, fire and gas detection, um, deluge system, which we all spoke about during our speaking about safeguards. So make it simple, all of the safeguards which are valid and put in the boat eyes to identify the barriers in the events are safety critical element. Maybe there is another, if we spoke in detail, maybe in another assessment, we can even make them a little bit less because they have to pass another uh, certain criteria, which we, it's out of our scope today. But make it simple, all of the barriers are safety critical elements. And what our target is to make sure that these safety critical elements, whenever we need them, uh, they are ready. And to make that, we have to manage the safety critical elements and to have to make the tests, the proper tests and the safety critical tasks to maintain these safety critical elements uh, adequately with a, a time manner and with the competent personnel. So uh, what is written here is systematic management of identify or identified the safety critical element is a continuous process, ensuring that the safety barriers are in place and effective with the specific performance standards. Just leave the performance standards and we'll talk about it uh, just in the coming uh, slides. The components that are classified as safety critical elements are governed strictly with regards to preventive and corrective maintenance. What is the difference between preventive and corrective maintenance? Preventive is that uh, you have a periodical test. Every year, for example, you are testing this uh, valve, we are testing this uh, pressure safety valve to make sure that it's adequately processing. Okay, uh, you test it, it's preventive. Corrective if it's failed to do its job. So we have to do a corrective maintenance for it. And it doesn't relate to a specific time. Whenever it uh, needs, we have to do it. These are some categories of the critical the safety critical elements. So when once you define the uh, safety critical elements according to the barriers which we defined in the bow tie, uh, you go to the asset register for any asset, offshore or onshore, and get all of the list, uh, put, uh, take all of these equipment which is related under the barriers and categorize them here uh, as safety critical elements uh, in these categories. And these are not all the categories. The categories can reach to even uh, 30 or 40. Uh, we have, uh, I just gave you a glance or just like an example of them. Process containment in integrity, uh, well containment, corrosion prevention and corrosion monitoring, 
ريليف سيستم اجنيشن بريفنتيف بريفنشن سيستمز فلامبل جاز ديتكشن فاير ديتكشن اند اول اوف ذيف هاز ذيم هاف ذير سب سيستمز از يو كان سي بريشر فيسلز بايب وورك اكسشينجرز ماشينري اتسترا سو اول اوف ذيس ار كاتيجرايزد فروم ذي اسيت ريجستر اكوردنج تو ذا باريرز ويتش هاز بين ايدنتيفايد ان ذا فولتيج These are the safety critical identification. We identified all of the safety critical elements in our site to maintain our site uh, safe. And in case of any incident from the major accident hazard we uh, identified at the beginning, I think we think it will be safe. Okay, we identified the safety critical element. How can we make sure that they are manageable or managed and uh, maintained, uh, do, maintaining doing its, uh, its work by uh, developing a document called performance standard? So what is the standard? The objective of performance standard is to provide is to provide a means of verifying a safety critical element effectiveness against its original design intention, and to ensure it's con it continues to meet its performance requirement throughout its life. Very simple, I think. Uh, the document itself uh, contains five categories. The most important one is the functionality. So the first one is scene setting. What is define the safety critical element we are speaking about? The boundaries and goals. For example, we are talking now about the fire and gas detection systems. Uh, the functionality, what must the safety critical element to do? What must the fire and gas detection system do? And we have to identify that in detail and in the in the performance standard. This is developed by the process safety team. However, it is implemented by maintenance team. So uh, safety critical element, uh, fire and gas uh, detection has to do one, two, three, four, uh, with even numerical uh, figures, has to meet it. And the test should be done uh, annually, for example, and uh, the test should cover uh, whatever, whatever the action could be. This is the functionality. To test the functionality of this safety critical element in a periodic manner. Availability and reliability, how can we ensure that it's available and reliable as well? Uh, and survivability, it's not uh, it's not common to be put in all of the safety critical elements, uh, the survivability, because it relates, it relates to some uh, some safety critical elements and it's not related to uh, others. Uh, relates, for example, to the ESD valves, but not relates to other uh, uh, safety critical elements. And at the end, the interactions between the safety critical elements themselves. If uh, you have any safety critical element which is uh, relying on another, or maybe integrating with another, you have to mention it here. So at the end, what we care about here is the functionality, and make sure that this functionality is clear to the maintenance engineers to make sure that this uh, equipment is, uh, is, uh, is meeting our, our, uh, our specifications and meeting its original design intention. This is very important. So this is the whole cycle, starting from the major accident hazard till we reach to the performance standard. This is uh, the international intention right now to make sure that this cycle is, uh, is, uh, is robust and completed uh, for any asset and make sure that uh, it's, uh, it's managed and then the compile it in a safety case uh, document at the end. Next topic, we'll speak a little bit about uh, the process hazard the reduction approaches. And the uh, most commonly way is the, to make your uh, design inher inherently safe. And how can you make it uh, inher inherently safe? Is to ensure that all of the hazards are eliminated. But can, be, can this uh, be reasonable or uh, rational? I don't think so. Uh, you cannot reach 100% uh, safe uh, design. However, you are, you are doing your best at the beginning of a project to make sure that if something can be uh, eliminated, you have to you have to do it, and this is done by four uh, means: minimize, substitute, simplify, and moderate. Minimize from from its name uh, at the beginning of uh, any project, uh, you have to make sure uh, that uh, any any amount of uh, a hydrocarbon or any amount of a hazardous material uh, could be minimized. Do it. For example, if you are injecting methanol in the wells or in the pipeline after the wells. And you are you are designing a tank of a thousand barrels, for example, and you are just using you don't need this whole amount, and you just need 500. So make your best to make it 500 only. So minimize as much as possible the amount of this uh, hazardous uh, material. Then substitute. Uh, in case this methanol we spoke about, it can be substituted with another material, doing the same purpose. However, 
it has a higher flash point, which is which means it's safer. So do it. So it's substitute. If if you cannot, so you cannot. So you have to still uh, do, uh, you have to still use the same hazardous material. But if in any case you can uh, use uh, another material which can do the the same purpose, uh, however uh, have less uh, severity, use it. This is the means of substitute. Moderate. It relates a little bit to the conditions. So if you are operating on shore and the facility expected to operate at, a, at a, for example, 70 bar, and you can uh, get whatever you need uh, with less pressure, so our intention is to make the, the pressure less. The temperature as well, uh, whatever uh, threat can be released from uh, the conditions and can, can uh, be moderated, so uh, we have to target that at the beginning of any, of any project. And last thing, which is simplify. So design facilities to eliminate unnecessary complexity. Make sure that the complexities uh, are, are less. And, uh, and maybe use of, uh, yani, may, may try to make the, the, the operation itself uh, less complex. Because if, if it's uh, higher, in, higher in complexity, uh, at the end it will lead to uh, uh, more uh, um, more harder in, in, in operation or, and maintenance as well. And uh, it will increase your backlog at the end. And then it might have an incident uh, or may, might uh, lead to a hazard at the end. So these are the four things which you have to think about while you are doing uh, uh, or implementing or uh, starting a project uh, from, process si from process safety uh, side. Uh, again, you have to maybe deal with the process engineer to make sure that he can minimize or substitute or moderate or simplify whatever uh, hazardous material, material you are going to use uh, in your uh, facility. So now, uh, the hazard identification techniques, DHA, process hazard analysis. Um, this is uh, a vital tool uh, in uh, process safety to identify all of the hazards in your facility and to make sure that it's uh, it's managed and uh, and maybe if you have any gaps you can rectify that uh, what are the tools we have qualitative methods semi quantitative and quantitative so qualitative from its name it's a simple one uh, you don't need the details you, do, you don't need numbers uh, you don't need the calculations or even softwares uh, we have three common types here, but we still have uh, a lot more. Hazard, hazardous, uh, hazards and, uh, hazard and operability study. Hazard, uh, hazards identification study. What if study. And we have uh, some more, but these are the common or the most important uh, types of qualitative methods. Next uh, is the semi-quantitative method, LOPA, layers of protection analysis. We use numbers, we use uh, calculations. Uh, a lot of references are used in, in LOPA and uh, it's a, it is um, an essential part done after HAZOB or HAZIT, uh, specifically in a, a very severe uh, scenarios uh, to identify by numbers how severe is the scenario and how can we manage it. And the last thing which is quantitative is the highest level and it's the most maybe effective one, however it's uh, uh, though it's, it's expensive. Uh, which is quantitative risk assessment, QRA, quantitative risk assessment. Today, uh, let's speak a little bit about QRA, HAZOB, and what if. And we'll not go de to details. However, I, I just want to show you how, uh, how the hazards can be identified uh, through these uh, uh, techniques. The first is QRA, quantitative risk assessment. Uh, it's done uh, by uh, softwares. Uh, the famous and the most known ones is FAST. FAST is uh, a software owned by DMVGL as, uh, as far as I remember. And uh, FAST is uh, a consequence analysis uh, software. And then after you do the consequence analysis, you do probability and the risk analysis. It's done by a software called uh, Safati. Fred and Shepard are common ones as well owned by Shell. Uh, FRED uh, is a consequence analysis as well. Regarding consequence analysis, you are you are calculating what you are calculating fire, or actually not calculating uh, modeling, fire, radiation, explosion, and dispersion. Fire, radiation, explosion, and dispersion. These are the four things which can be modeled in the software, 
and consequently you can see what is the effect of these scenarios on personnel and maybe equipment and any maybe other assets which is outside the the, the facility in here I will not speak ab uh, about this for now. I will, I, will, I, will, I will mention it at the end, what is the importance of URA. However, let's see uh, this image first. So this, this image is an outcome of uh, a consequence analysis from FAST uh, regarding um, um, this is a platform. Hopefully it's clear. And uh, there is a vessel here which is containing methanol, if you can see here, methanol. And this is done by fast, okay. Uh, you have to put some assumptions like uh, the weather. The weather 1.5 F, 1.5 is meter per second, 1.5, and the F is the, ex uh, the intensity of the weather. And then the direction is uh, 350 degree. And the outcome is this. It's like contours. And you can see there is one red, uh, green, and, and blue. And you put these uh, numbers in there. So you need, for example, it's, it's an explosion worst case radii so it's radiuses for uh, radii for uh, explosion for sure the one inside which is in red is the highest one so in this zone in red zone everybody can be affected by three par so it's the three par effect area and in the yellow one it's 0 0.28 why it is important to mention that uh, because we need to know the effect of an incident, an accident could happen here by a loss of containment of a methanol leading to explosion. How could it reach and how could it affect? Okay, for example, we said here that it's 0 0.28. Is that safe or not? It depends on each company perspective and each company standard to reach a LARB. So a LARB stands for as low as reasonably practicable as low as reasonably practicable. So if the company said that, for example, uh, it's safe to, sorry, it's safe to, to have the uh, pressure of 0.04, for example, bar uh, to be to, to the equipment, okay, it's safe uh, to the personnel, it should be less. So these images and these contours give you an extent and understanding where the area could be safe for, any, for uh, existing of personnel and, and equipment for explosion. It's not only explosion. We said that you can uh, model uh, the dispersion as well. So uh, in here, it's a, it's a model for dispersion for this uh, for this uh, place. It, it's a natural gas, and we said that the height of inter interest, which means this this contours, it can, it can differ from the height of interest. So this is at a height of one meter. If it's two meter, the, the contours will uh, will differ. And you put your assumptions from a weather and wind direction as well. And at the end, these contours uh, comes. And according to uh, the severity levels and a large numbers of any uh, of any company, you can mention uh, you ca you can know uh, what level uh, you are safe. But here we are speaking we are speaking about cloud, which is dispersion of a gas. And this is very important. So, for example, in the red one, it's one five six thousand ppm. Of this component, which is, I think it, it was uh, natural gas or hydrocarbon, and in the green one, it's uh, less for sure. It's uh, thirty-eight thousand bpm, and uh, the bigger one is uh, nineteen thousand. And this helps out what, uh, in what it helps out in putting the fire and gas detection system. If uh, if you know at what level you have to put your uh, fire and gas detection system, you put it according to these uh, uh, contours. And again, I'm just uh, talking about the consequence analysis. The, uh, there is another software, which is Safati, gives indication about uh, the probability. The same, it's, um, it can give you, uh, the, the tool gives you the opportunity to use even uh, maps like this. And it gives you an indication how could be even some uh, equipment, some, sorry, uh, buildings outside the vicinity affected by uh, and any any explosion or any incident can happen inside your facility, especially for onshore uh, facilities. And after that, uh, you have to make use uh, of this info to, to ensure that the the equipment or the buildings will be affected is safe enough by building a fire uh, blast wall or fire fire wall or a blast wall or or make the especially if if it's in the design phase, so you have to relocate the 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 equipment which can cause these uh, these uh, scenarios 
So how key, how can the QRA helps in uh, in our industry? It, again, to demonstrate a lot as low as reasonably practicable, and it differs from a company to another. The numbers uh, differs, and uh, again, and uh, you have to ensure that uh, this uh, alarm is maintained uh, in any aspect uh, in your uh, in your facility. For ERB emergency response plan, so if you knew that uh, the contour will reach a place which you cannot, uh, which uh, you have to, uh, for for example, uh, uh, evacuate in case of emergency. So it helps in in what in what uh, uh, way you will go and the, the plan uh, to be put uh, according to the uh, contours uh, outcome. And the last thing which you spoke about, the, the fire and gas mapping, uh, put the fire and gas detection according to the outcome of uh, the QRA. And fire and gas mapping itself is a study. Uh, the QRA is a feed to this study only. But uh, it's important to identify all of the scenarios which can lead to fire and, uh, uh, and dispersion, especially. So this is the QRA. Uh, what if, um, uh, as we said, it's a qualitative method, and maybe it's the least structured method to identify the hazard. What if? And from its name, what if? It's a question. So it's uh, it's uh, a gathering of uh, experienced personnel as well in the industry and uh, for uh, have experience in the facility, which is under uh, study. And while you are doing any uh, change in this facility. You have to do uh, what if to make sure that there is nothing can affect uh, the hazards or can affect the, the facility and cause extra risk. Uh, what if uh, could be a human error? What if operator fails to restart pump, for example? And uh, what if, uh, if it's external event? What if a very hard freeze uh, persists? Just an example. And the final shape of uh, the what if is uh, here. You can mention the list of what if questions you mentioned and your team. If there is a hazard, you have to mention it here. If there is no hazard out of the question, so you can just mention that it's not it's safe or no credible scenario or or no uh, big consequence. But if there is a hazard, so you you, you should comp you should complete the consequences safeguards. And if you have any action or suggestion, it should be put in here. If you can remember, it's a little bit uh, similar to Bowtie. However, Bowtie is uh, more uh, detailed because uh, the Bowtie consists of uh, more uh, uh, details uh, uh, of uh, the scenario, not only the hazard and the consequence safeguard. You still have top event and the threat uh, and barriers. Barriers here can be represented by safeguards. But it, uh, they are all a means of identification of a hazard, uh, but they differ. Uh, by the method and how depth uh, they are done. The HAZOB is another study, still qualitative. Uh, all of that, uh, we didn't mention anything about uh, numbers. As in the QRA, we use the detailed software like uh, Fast and Fred and Safati. But here, it's only a group of people who are uh, gathering to identify the risks and hazards of a change they are doing outside or a pure, uh, a, a brand new design uh, to, 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 to get an idea of what are the hazards and how it will be managed and whether we have sufficient safeguards in place or not. The hazard is more uh, common than the what if uh, because it's a little bit more structured than the what if. What if is just a talking thing, but has we, we have a more structured way and it can be shown here, the parameters, you have to mention the parameter first, which is temperature, pressure, uh, flow, uh, maybe composition as well. And uh, guide words could be more or less other than uh, no. And then the deviation itself, so will, it will be more temperature, for example. So it's a guide word more temperature. What is leading to more temperature? It's a collaborative discussion and it's a brainstorming amongst it, the team. With the push, uh, the piping and instrumentation diagrams, it's uh, I don't know if you are aware of that or not, but it's piping and instrumentation diagram uh, is used as the, the 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 tool or the drone they use uh, to identify uh, uh, or the, to to facilitate the hazard. Then they mention the causes, consequences, as as previously said, or the cause safeguards, and then if you have any recommendations out of uh, of uh, the discussion. It's a more structured way because you cannot lose uh, anything. You you start with temperature and you will do more uh, less uh, higher than uh, less than all of the guide words for the temperature. So 
losing any scenario, it will be less probability than what if. What if it's only a brainstorming thing without any structure. Um, hopefully that was clear. Um, last slide for today uh, is process safety management system. Um, so we have three types or three uh, entities, three institutions uh, provides their uh, way of uh, maintaining process safety management in any facility or any uh, company. The three are uh, Energy Institute, CCPS, and OSHA. Um, the elements in these uh, institutes represents the elements which the uh, think that it has to be maintained in even detailed uh, points in their uh, aspects uh, in all of the company in uh, to, to, to make sure that it meets the safety or it can it can be named as a company who is meeting process safety management system uh, these are the three uh, common ones there is another however uh, these are the, co the, the the most famous ones OSHA have 14 elements uh, CCBS 20 and Energy Institute is uh, has 20 as well they are pretty much uh, similar, especially Energy Institute and CCPS. Our OSHA has this uh, number in, in elements, uh, though it has very strict uh, requirements and very clear as well. And uh, it is a very old uh, uh, system which is used in a lot of companies. Now I will just show you one example, which is CCPS. Um, it is categorized as commit to process safety understanding hazards and risks, manage risks, learn from experience. These are the main categories of uh, these elements, and the elements itself in, are very specific. So commit to process safety, how process safety culture is maintained in your company, compliance with the standards while you are doing designing, for, exa for example, uh, your, your facility, uh, safety uh, process safety competency and it relates a little bit to the HR because uh, did you have sufficient expertise at your site to maintain process safety leadership and process safety uh, work sorry uh, workforce involvement the stakeholder outreach especially if uh, you if you are working very close to other company which might be affecting affected by your uh, production or uh, maybe polluted by your uh, production uh, understanding hazards and risks, um, process management, uh, process knowledge management, and hazard identification risk analysis and hazard identification is mainly the hazard and, and what if uh, and all of these sorts of uh, hazard identification we spoke about, if it is maintained in their sites or not, and uh, while they are doing uh, management of change, for example, uh, is it uh, is it obligatory to have the hazard or not uh, for these changes? And process uh, knowledge management uh, includes all of the documentation of uh, process safety. How to manage risk? Uh, it relates all of this uh, relates to uh, asset integrity and maintenance and uh, projects as well, including management of change, operation readiness, uh, conduct of operations, whether it's uh, uh, it is purely effective or not, emergency management. Uh, all of these uh, elements uh, have a lot of uh, requirements under uh, underneath them and there is an audit uh, to be done by a lot of uh, third party companies to uh, to the clients to make sure that they are meeting this and whether they have gaps or not and if they have gaps so the 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 gap analysis should be uh, should be closed to meet uh, to meet the target of uh, saying that it is complying with process safety management system as CCPS, USHA, or Energy Institute. Hopefully that was useful and clear. Thank you, and uh, I'm open uh, if you have any questions. Thank you, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Engineer Omar, for the great presentation. Uh, I have uh, some questions for you, if you don't mind. The, the first question, someone asking, what is the difference between um, um, uh, hazard and incident? Well, the incident, uh, you can name it as a scenario. Uh, the incident, the hazard itself is part of the incident. So uh, if I will, I will just show you. So the incident is the whole thing. So this whole thing, if we put it in detail, it will be an incident. I, I put here an example, I think, for the car. So the, the car crash is the incident 
However, the hazard here was driving. Uh, the hazard in our facilities uh, could be uh, the crude oil. So this is the hazard itself, which can lead to a potential, uh, potential loss of containment, which can lead to the uh, consequences. However, the whole structure called the incident, and maybe you can call it the scenario as well. This is the difference. Okay, uh, uh, I have a second question. Someone asking about uh, hazard and risk uh quant uh, quantifiable like uh, he wanna know how we calculate in numerical mean what is uh, you know calculate the hazard or uh, risk okay um, um well i will try to make it simple uh, for example we have loper layers of protection analysis uh if we uh, if we put a scenario like uh, uh, we have an explosion, we have uh, hydrocarbon, and it can lead to loss of containment, leading to explosion, three fatalities, uh, and the environmental impact, for example. Three fatalities in, in the company, in a specific company, uh, we name it, I don't want to, to go through details, but however, okay, we, we name it as a target event frequency. So target event frequency, uh, they don't want to have three fatalities uh, only for one, once every 100 years, or, um, even even more, uh, 200 years, for example. So this is a number. We put we use this number in our calculation. One over 200. This single number. Okay. What are the causes we have? We have several causes. Okay. These causes have specific probability to happen. These probability are again given in the company standard. So we take these numbers as well. And then do we have protection layers? Yes. We have uh, several protection layers in place. Uh, we have pressure safety valve. We have, uh, for example, gas detection. Put it, uh, put, uh, put as uh, protection layers. They have figures which called probability of failure on demand. Probability of failure on demand, and these are figures as well. They fail, for example, one every ten times to be used. So we will put 0.1. They will fail one every hundred times to be used. So we put 0.01. All of these numbers are put in equations, certain equations, and it ended up with a number which you can, it can tell you what is the level of severity you have or what it, whether these safeguards are efficient and adequate and enough to protect you against what your company wants. Because in certain companies, for example, the target event frequency, they put it very uh, strict. So they don't want these three fatalities to happen even once uh, for uh, 10,000 years. That makes uh, the safety, uh, the, the, the layers protection has to be a little bit more, if you get what I mean, because the numbers will not be sufficient to protect against this uh, target event frequencies. This for LOPA. In addition, the, the quantitative uh, risk assessment we spoke about, uh, the, uh, the, the softwares had a lot of calculations inside it. So to calculate all of these contours, it, it is very detailed calculations to, uh, to measure the radiation contours, uh, the dispersion, the uh, the explosion or uh, or uh, or dispersion. So these are all numerical. But the common way to to uh, measure hazards in the facilities is the easiest way, and it's the level one way, which is qualitative, like the hazard or uh, what if. Okay, I, I have another question. Someone asking about is uh, earthquake considered a risk, uh, taking into consideration what happened. In 2011, in uh, Fukushima, the uh, earthquake in Japan. So um, it seems like he, he want to ask about what should be the safe uh, shutdown for you know uh, uh, processing equipment. Um, it's not uh, a risk which we speak about uh, when we do any modification for an existing plan. However, it's a risk which is considered uh, greatly at the beginning of any project. At the beginning of any project, we we do something called ENVID, e -N -V -I -D, which is, stands for environmental identification. So it's similar to hazard, the hazards identification, we name it environmental identification. And very great part of it is the earthquake. And if there is a potential for that in this area of, uh, of, uh, of the plant, which plan to be erected or uh, implemented, or planned uh, or planted uh, or built, sorry, uh, we should uh, reconsider the location. 
So it, we cannot uh, raise this uh, very late because it's a major issue. And uh, as you have said, it's not easy to uh, to uh, to uh, put a safeguard protecting us from such uh, great thing. But at the beginning, you can uh, you can mitigate it. Uh, if there is a risk, and there is certain measures for sure uh, to measure whether this uh, area can be uh, can be affected by this uh, sort of uh, things. Okay, so uh, th the last question for today uh, session: someone asking how to ensure the, uh, that the sensors and uh, barriers are working properly at any time. Um, we will go back to the performance standard. So uh, by developing the performance standard, and uh, we put uh, for the uh, sheet of uh, safety and instrumented systems in and, and basic process control systems in the performance standard, in the functionality, we put that we have to test the, the sensor in a periodic manner and make sure that it uh, and, and the, the, the levels are, are correct and, uh, and the tuning are, are correct as well. And if uh, if this is okay, so it could be, or you can you can name it as adequate for uh, for its purpose. Uh, this is the the, the way. And um, by doing that, the we name we name the the action itself by safety critical uh, activity or safety critical task. Uh, but it should be according to the performance standard which we uh, which we developed as a last stage after identifying of the uh, safety critical elements. Engineer Omar, uh, thank you very much for the great webinar today, and uh, uh, we wish to see you again soon in uh, other webinars. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.